Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Good Friday meditation on the seven last words of Christ. It certainly feels as though our world, um, our communities, our families have been participating in the passion over these weeks of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so we thought that this would be the perfect opportunity to take some time and pause and reflect together on an amalgam of the gospel narratives of the passion that are represented by the seven last words of Christ. Because as we know, it's important to relate the scripture to our lives and to our experience, especially at times like this. So to that end, we've gathered a very talented group of folks to help us reflect on those words. And I would like to introduce you to them. I'm gonna ask each of you to raise your hand when I introduce you, just in case people don't know you. So first up, Jimmy Smits. Jimmy Smits is our narrator today. He'll be proclaiming the scripture texts. As you know, Jimmy is an award-winning actor who has appeared on stage, television, and film. And he'll soon be seen in the film version of the Broadway hit, In the Heights. Uh, he's best known probably for his roles on LA Law, NYPD Blue, The West Wing, the Star Wars prequel trilogy, Sons of Anarchy, Dexter, we could go on and on. But he is also a longtime friend of mine and the passionist, and really happy to have him here. Jim O'Shea. Jim O'Shea is a passionist priest, and he's currently the provincial of the passionists. That also means head honcho. And he is the executive director of Reconnect Brooklyn in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Matthew Gewertz. He's the senior rabbi of B'nai Jeshurun in Short Hills, New Jersey. He's the president of the Coalition of Religious Leaders of the State of New Jersey and the author of The Gift of Grief, Finding Peace. Matthew appears as a commentator on religion on MSNBC's Morning Joe and CNN's State of the Union. And he recently started his own television series as a tri-anchor of PBS's, the show's called A Matter of Faith with a Bishop, an Imam, and a Rabbi. Karen Cavanaugh. Karen is a sister of St. Joseph of Brentwood, and she's a trained spiritual director and retreat facilitator. Michaela Pereira. Michaela is a journalist and public speaker who has reported and anchored for local news and internationally for CNN and HLN. She has served as a chairwoman of the board of LA's Best Friends, an after-school education enrichment and recreational program, and as a member of the board of directors of the Long Beach Boys and Girls Club. Michaela is a member of the National Association of Black Journalists and American Women in Radio and Television. Roberto Ciotti. Roberto is founding principal of Larkin Architect Limited. The work of his practice is focused on sustainable sacred space and includes the award-winning St. Gabriel's Passionist Parish Church in Toronto, Canada, which is designed to embody the echo theology of the Passionist priest Thomas Berry. Enzo Del Brocco. Enzo is a passionist priest who was born in Pittsburgh, but grew up in Italy. He has served in our passionist mission in Haiti for five years, and he's currently working on his doctorate in healthcare ethics at Duquesne University. And finally, Sunny Hostin. Sunny is a lawyer and a television host. She's co-host of The View and the senior legal correspondent and analyst for ABC News. She is also the host and executive producer of Investigation Discovery's True Crime Series, Truth About Murder with Sonny Hostin. It's an illustrious group. Uh, I thank all of you for being with us today. And now I'm gonna ask Jimmy to proclaim our first scripture passage from the Passion. As they led Jesus away, they took hold of him. They took hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country. And after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women 
who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. At that time, people will say to the mountains, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if these things are done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now, two others, both criminals, were led away with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right, the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Standing in Reconnect Cafe in Brooklyn a few years ago, and I realized there was an altercation uh, starting outside, and it was between one of our employees, one of our young guys, and another young guy. So I went outside, and when I got there, the uh, one young guy took off, and I asked my employee what happened, and he said, there was a lot of bad blood between these two. So he was standing outside and this one guy, other guy passed him, bumped him, and the altercation started. But while we were talking, the other guy came back around the corner and he headed back towards the two of us. Now, when he was coming back, he was wearing a jacket this time. So we were both wondering if maybe he was bringing something back to the, to the, uh, to the fight. So when he got there, he went right up into my employee's face and they went eye to eye, nose to nose, uh, and, and you could feel that bad blood just boiling. And they started. One said, you apologize. And the other one said, no, you apologize. And so you apologize. No, you apologize. And, and as their voices kind of uh, just intensified and the tone lowered and lowered, my pressure was going higher and higher. And, and I had no idea what to do, but whether it was through uh, inspiration or, or desperation, I blurted out. I said, I apologize. I said, I apologize to you, and I apologize to you. That's it. It's over. And they both stopped. And, and, and the, the guy with the jacket kind of looked at me, not exactly sure what to make of me, and he just shook his head, and he muttered something about, forget it. And, and he walked away. They both lived through that day and they both keep living. Father, forgive them. You know, it's as if Jesus is saying to the Father, let it end in me. Let all the bad blood, let all the hatred and the violence and the cruelty and the misuse of God and the revenge, let it all end in my innocent blood. Let it end so that they might be free to live differently. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, oh. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? They divided his garments by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at Jesus and said, We saved others, let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. Above him there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. 
The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so from the Jew and rabbi on the screen, I offer the following parable with such love and respect and honor to my Catholic, passionist, Christian brothers and sisters. The story goes from the late 1800s that there was a rabbi who graduated last from his rabbinic school class. He came out in his first day of pastoring. A young man comes up and says, Rabbi, I have a question. What's the difference between heaven, between paradise and hell? This is the first question he gets for a kid who graduated last in his class. And so he knew enough to say, at least let me sleep on it. He goes to sleep that night. An angel comes to him and says, Rabbi, come with me. They go down a long hallway and make a left turn into this banquet hall, banquet hall that you just never experienced before. The finest of clothing, the top shelf of liquor, the most delicious of food. The waiters and waitresses were dressed in tuxedos, people in gowns. And he says, Angel, what am I doing here? He says, Rabbi, stop running your mouth and just feel, just listen. So he feels, and he feels great pain and great longing in the room. And he says, Angel, why does it feel so badly? And he says, now really look and observe. And everyone's lined up at tables across from each other, all this delicious food and drink. But there's only one problem. No one has elbows in the room. So their hands are out directly like this with all this food in front of them, but they can't feed themselves. So the angel says to the rabbi, Rabbi, Welcome to hell. Now come with me. Down another long hallway, they make a left into a banquet room that looks exactly the same. And he says, Angel, why are you taking me back to hell? I don't want to go back and feel that pain anymore. He says, Rabbi, again with the mouth, stop running it. Just feel. And he feels a great sense of connection and fulfillment and sustenance. And he says, now, Rabbi, look and observe. He goes back and sure enough, no one has elbows in this room either. And he says, again, why? They have no elbows, this is torture. He says, Rabbi, keep on looking. So the difference in this room is that people with their arms without elbows extended out, take the food in front of them and simply reach across and feed those who are opposite of them. He says, Rabbi, welcome to heaven. He floats back down, he wakes up, he goes on, he answers the question of his students and goes on to become the most important rabbi in Eastern Europe, what we call the Rebbe, sort of the rabbi of all rabbis. On his own deathbed at 120, which is the day, the years that Moses got, so considered most worthy of honor, his disciples all gather around him and say, Rebbe, before you go, what made you so great? And he says, you know, my children, right when I got out of rabbinic school, I was taught and I learned that, of course, you have to know the basics. You have to know your scripture. You have to know your law. You have to know your parables. You got to know what you got to know. But I learned early on also that it's the seemingly simple things that people seem to make so darn complex in this world. Feeding your neighbor, clothing the naked, unshackling the oppressed. If you do those things every day, you can take a little bit of heaven and bring it down here to earth. So we have different views of how fast and what it is that paradise means to all of us. But one thing in an ecumenical way that all of us ag could agree with is that during what we're going through, especially now, that it's our job to simply pick up something in front of us and feed our neighbor, make them warm and unshackle them from whatever it is that bonds them. Because there's too many of us that feel constricted and all of us during the spring of renewal totally deserve to be free. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it 
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be, in order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments amongst them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. It's probably the primal word or sound uttered by a baby. Ma, 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 mama, mommy. And it lasts through most of our adulthood. Whenever we're faced with pain or suffering or fear of a future. And we hear the comforting sounds. I'm here. I'm right here. I've got you. Don't be afraid. 18 years ago, I drove four, four hours each way to Pike County Jail in Pennsylvania to bring a mother who would say goodbye to her son who was being deported to the country which he left when he was five. He had served time in a New York correctional facility and rather than be paroled, was transferred to deportation. This mother and this son for only a 20 minute visit, palm to palm against the barrier of a plexiglass partition, tried to say the words they needed to say to each other, tried say the words they couldn't say to each other. Two months ago, I was at the border in El Paso and a van pulled up to our center. Two uh, security patrol uh, border police got out of the car with bulletproof vests and weapons at each side of their hip and slid open the van door and out jumped a little eight-year-old boy who was lame. As he jumped, his sneaker fell off his foot. He picked up his sneaker and limped his way to us and to security. His mother ran behind him, got down on her knees and said, I've got you. And she put his sneaker back on his foot. I learned later that the shoelaces of sneakers and shoes were taken from everyone in a detention center so that they wouldn't be able to move about, so that they would be tied and locked in a place. Bravery only comes and courage only comes in the face of fear. Did Jesus, seeing the presence of his mother, gain courage, gain comfort, Realize he was not alone and he could still yet teach one more lesson. The disciple, the friend, behold, here is your mother. Take her, accompany her, comfort her, bring her to your home, bring her to your heart. My brothers and sisters, we are the disciples. We are the ones called to accompany, to comfort, to secure, to give safety and courage to. We are the ones 
who will help that all this world might be one. Don't be afraid. He's got us. Were you there when they pierced him inside? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Oh, sometimes. It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced in me the side? Those passing by revile Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests and the scribes mocked him amongst themselves and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In about 2015, I was working in Manhattan um, at CNN and uh, had been there for a couple of years, but was finding myself overwhelmed by the amount of grief and painful stories that I was covering. I was a long way from home on the West Coast, a long way from my family in Canada. I found myself burdened, overwrought, distressed, without any sort of direction and far from everything I loved. One day I found myself at the end of my rope and I was in my change room at um, Time Warner Center and I fell to my knees and tearfully implored God. I asked him to send me a sign, to send me an angel that I was not alone. I remember asking, had he forsaken me? I've walked in faith my entire life, but in that moment, I didn't hear anything and I didn't see anything. Wiped my tears, got back into my car that was waiting to take me to my apartment. But before I got into the car, I saw a man cross the street and he walked right towards me. It was Byron Pitts, an ABC News correspondent who I'd never met before, but had long admired. And he walked to me and openly was with his arms open wide, warmly said, Michaela, I've always wanted to meet you. This is so amazing that we get to run into each other. And then he took me, put his arm on, uh, hand on my arm and looked into my eyes and said, how are you? My poker face was gone. And I told him, brother, I'm having a day. I'm struggling. Because I couldn't lie. He just saw right through it. And before he could continue, he looked at me and said, Joshua 1-9, look it up when you get home. And I was taken aback. I'm on the streets of New York and some cat's given me scripture. So I committed it to memory. Got in the, we chat a little bit more, got in the car, drove home with the intention of getting my Bible out and, and finding the scripture. But of course we have technology. So I got on my phone and looked it up and there it was, Joshua 1-9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I went home and told my partner of 16 years over the phone here in Los Angeles what had happened. And I was just so incredulous. I couldn't believe that God had heard me and had sent a message to me. Eight months later, he had that passage put on a necklace for me.
and gave it to me for Christmas. I wear it around my neck as a touchstone to remember that wherever I am, God has not forsaken me. Even these times of isolation and desolation and anxiety and fear and the unknown, he has not forsaken me. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. So Jesus on the cross must have suffered immeasurably. And in those final words, he shared with us a dying person's desperate need to have his thirst quenched. Such a wrenching human experience challenges our imagination, demanding solidarity with Jesus and with all of today's crucified. Last Friday, I was on the construction site of St. Benedict's, a church that I had designed in response to the Holy Father's encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. I can't help pausing to think that all of God's creation has been suffering, and that perhaps COVID-19 is a way for the earth to remind us of our neglect for her. Recalling the words of Passionist Father Thomas Berry, we cannot expect to have healthy humans on an unhealthy planet. Jesus promised living water to slake the human thirst to know God. At St. Benedict's, I was standing in the worship space with the pastor and two members of his parish building committee thinking about the, or reviewing the mock-ups of all the liturgical furnishings. A few short months away from completion of the church. At just about 3 p.m., we received the devastating news that our provincial government was immediately shutting down all non-essential construction sites as their next move to flatten the curve of the COVID-19 virus. So there it was, it was abruptly over. I could see that in that moment, we were all left thirsting to complete this holy place of worship. But then I thought that people of every faith are thirsting to gather in their churches, their mosques, their synagogues, and their temples. But here we are on this Good Friday, not in our physical spaces, but instead gathered only virtually finding solidarity with each other, with God's creation, and Jesus at a time of shared suffering, thirsty. So for me personally, St. Benedict's represents my final contribution before retiring from decades dedicated to the design of sustainable sacred space. So it has become a meaningful point of entry for me to find solidarity with Jesus's words. I thirst. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, oh, tremble. 
There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. Two years ago, um, during Holy Week, it was exactly um, Good uh, Holy Thursday. I was visiting uh, the hospital and and we found a little girl wrapped in a blanket. She was a preemie. Um, she could she barely weighed a pound. Uh, just to imagine how how little this girl was. And uh, the blessing was that she survived. Um, and I went the following day, Good Friday, to visit her. And in the meantime, um, there was a very loud scream. And I immediately thought that uh, one of the women, the mothers lost her child. Uh, so I run upstairs and instead it was uh, the child who was screaming out of pain. Uh, the child, 11 years old, had um, lymphoblastic leukemia, an acute one. Uh, his eyes were literally popping out and he was in so much pain and screaming, no one understands me, no one understands, no one understands my pain. So I go next to him and um, just try to give him some comfort, staying there most of the time in silence. He calms down and then he says, thank you. After that day, I, every day I would go to visit him. And this boy was very special because uh, he would continuously read the Bible uh, or and at a certain point when he could not read anymore for his, for, because of his eyes, he would have his, have his mom reading it for him. One day I, I'm visiting again and he asks me uh, to explain to him the passage about uh, the multiplication of bread and fish. And particularly what, Jesus, what did Jesus mean by saying I am the bread of life? So I started to give a little bit of catechesis to explain to him what it was all about. And then he asked me, what do I have to do to be baptized and have first communion? And I said, well, we can do it tomorrow. So I spoke with the doctor and uh, I wanted to be sure that he wouldn't be compromised by doing anything. And she said, no, actually let's set up a party. So we set up a beautiful party, a beautiful celebration. He had his communion and his mom unfortunately could not for reasons that I'm not here to, to explaining now, but anyway, her mother too, his mother was so happy about that celebration and he felt better. Um, after a few days, he was able to go home. And unfortunately, after three months, he comes back to the hospital. Um, the cancer came back very aggressively and uh, he was in his last days. Uh, one day, uh, again, I'm visiting him and he asked for communion. I asked the doctor if I can give it to him and I'm giving him communion. And before giving it to him, he says, what is heaven about? What does it look like? And I said, I don't know, what do you think it is? And he says, I think it's so beautiful that you can't even describe it. And I said, maybe it is. So anyway, I give him communion. And then he says, thank you. And he says, can I go to sleep now? He never woke up. That was his last action during his life. And I think that what I learned from uh, this little 11-year-old boy is that the accomplishment of your life doesn't depend by the length of it, by the number of years or days, but on how intense you live those years and days that you have at your disposal. Were you there? When they roll the stone away, were you there? When they roll the stone away, oh, sometimes it causes me. 
to tremble, tremble, oh, tremble. Were you there when they rolled the stone away? It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When I was uh, seven years old, I was very close to my father's brother, Uncle Ed. And one day we were uh, hanging out and uh, in the Bronx, in the projects where I grew up. And uh, I watched him get into an altercation with another man because he had been dating this other man's wife. And uh, the other man attacked my uncle and stabbed him in front of me. It was a very chaotic scene. And uh, I, we rushed into the bathroom and I remember trying to save his life. Uh, and he did live by stopping the bleeding. And I remembered at that moment, this chaotic moment that I would control the rest of my life, that this wouldn't be, uh, this chaotic feeling wouldn't be the way my life would, would uh, go. And I, from that moment on, really planned everything in my life. I credit my success to the control that I exhibited in every single part of my life. I planned where I would go to school. I worked really hard at that. Uh, I planned where I would work. I wanted to work for the Justice Department. That's what I did. Uh, I went to church every Sunday like a good Catholic girl would do. I went to Notre Dame because that's what a good Catholic girl would do. I uh, met my husband in church because that's what a good Catholic girl does. Uh, I married a doctor because I wanted to marry a doctor because that's what I do. Uh, and I wanted to be a mother more than anything in the world. And I tried and I tried and I tried and I couldn't get pregnant. It was something that I couldn't control. And then I finally did. After years and years of trying, I got pregnant. And then suddenly at the three month mark, when I could tell everyone that I was pregnant, I got uh, a torn placenta and I was rushed to the emergency room and I was told that my baby had a one in four chance of living, my baby boy. And that the only way that he could survive is if I laid in bed for the next six months, uh, six or seven months actually, and do nothing but be still. This control freak had to just be still. And I thought to myself, I can't do it. I can't control that. I can't do it. And I fell into a very deep depression, lying in bed, not being able to control anything. And I was very close to a nun. Her name was Sister Anne. And uh, my mother moved in with me and kept on buying clothes for this baby. And I yelled at my mother and said, stop buying clothes. We don't even know if he'll make it. In fact, I don't think he's going to make it. Sister Anne started calling me and she said, you must let go. You must find strength in letting go and resting in God. And I did that for the first time in my life. And my son Gabriel was born healthy and I found strength in letting go and resting in God. And I have now learned to live my life in that way. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it 
causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Wow. I mean, that was so powerful. Um, just to be able to sit here and listen and watch you and be taken in with all of those stories as they related to the scripture. And your stories to me were as powerful as the scripture and your relating of those stories. So, so thank you. I thank, thank you all so much for sharing so deeply and in such a heartfelt way. Thanks for showing how these passages can come to life and intersect our own lives, our daily lives. And thanks to all of you viewers for joining us for these meditations um, at a time when our world is certainly hungering for good news. I mean, the opportunity to share this good news is indeed a privilege. And you've allowed us to extend that privilege. Please be assured of our prayers um, and action for a world that right now is crying out for rebirth and renewal. And may the passion of Christ be always in our hearts. There's one person I did not introduce in the beginning because I knew that she was going to close for us. And it's the beautiful voice we've been hearing in between these meditations, that of Lacelli Lugo. I met Lacelli over 10 years ago, well, actually probably 15 years now, when I was ministering in a Harlem parish. And I was saying Mass that Sunday, and Lacelli got up to sing His Eye is on the Sparrow, and I was just floored. And I said, whatever I do in the future, that woman is going to be a part of whatever ministry it is. And then with the TV Mass, the Sunday Mass that many of you are familiar with, Lacelli as soon as we did that, became one of the uh, choir members and continues to this day to be um, a soloist and an ensemble member of the choir for the Sunday Mass. So thank you, Lacelli, for sharing your gift. Thanks to all of you. And Lacelli is now going to close our prayer at this time. Thank you so much, Father Beck. Calvary Calvary, 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 Surely he died on, on Calvary. Every time I, I think about my Jesus, every time I, I think about my Jesus, every time I, I think about my Jesus, Surely he died on, on Calvary. Sinner, do you, do you love my Jesus? Sinner, do you, do you love my Jesus? Yes, sinner, do you. Do you love my Jesus? Surely he died on, on Calvary.